All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Welcome to our uh, live Powell webcast. My name is uh, Kristen Moore. I'm the direct sales manager here at Powell Flutes, and I am joined by the wonderful Adam Walker, Powell artist, uh, longtime principal flutist of the London Symphony Orchestra. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hi, yeah. everyone. <laughs> and so, Adam, you are joining us not from the UK, but from Italy. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I ended up moving here about uh, three years ago now, I think. Time flies. My Italian is still really awful as well, so I find that quite embarrassing to <laughs> tell you I've been here for three years. Um, but yeah, I, I moved here to be with my partner, who is from this town where we're living, and more on that situation later, I'm sure. But um, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm in Brescia, which is in the, the north of Italy, in between Milan and Verona. So on the map, it's probably kind of middle north. So yeah, there that's where go. I am now. <laughs> so even though you might not be well versed in the language, I'm sure you're well versed in the food and the wine and all that good stuff. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was sorting out my wardrobe this morning, actually, because <laughs> most of my summer wardrobe is sadly not suitable um, for my shape anymore. So yeah, I've been eating lots of pasta, lots of pizza, drinking lots of delicious wine um etc purely because it's been nice to actually be here you know i mean what with the current situation i've been here a lot more i used to be traveling all the time for work and and whatnot so yeah i've, I've definitely been enjoying the, the food <laughs> yeah absolutely and it, uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in today we're going to discuss with adam his two new albums that just came out in april which if you have not listened listen to this webcast and then go find the albums because they are wonderful and um, such lovely flow and repertoire and playing from not just Adam, but all the musicians involved. Um, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about his career path, which has kind of shifted a little bit. Um, and then, you know, of course, all things flute playing, his Powell flute, I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, but Adam and I were, as we were setting up, we had to have a little bit of a laugh because over my oh, other shoulder, is Adam's picture right there. So one of the perks of uh, being here in our Powell showroom in Maidard, Massachusetts, we have all of our wonderful artists on the wall. So Adam, you're, always, you're always watching over. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very, I look a bit like scary in that photo as well. I'm like mm, <laughs> staring at you when you're trying to work. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a very, it, it really, yeah, it, it's really motivating. Mm. <laughs> So Adam, um, I'd love to start by talking about your solo album um, mm -hmm. released in April, as we mentioned, French Works for Flute. Um, as you mentioned, it's just such a great collection of repertoire. I love, you know, the sequences in between the music. Um, how did you choose what to include on the album? Well, I have to say, I didn't choose the name of the album. Um, it, which came about for various different reasons and whatnot. Um, but the repertoire on the album isn't necessarily what would spring to mind when someone says to you, you know, the French flute repertoire. We think of, of many pieces that we know and love. There's a big variety of, of French music, obviously. Um, but I suppose a, a lot of the music on, on this disc is from around the time where the flute started to really um, change its own path and change its own course around the time of Taffanel, who, who is one of the major kind of um, parts of this album in his own way. Um, but one thing that links all of the composers on this particular disc is that they were all organists, um, organists and composers, all of them, um, starting from César Frank and then Vidor, who actually took over César Frank's organ position in Paris, um, as well as, as Saint-Saint de Rouflet in some big churches in, in Paris. So yeah, all organ composers, um, quite kind of on the whole, fairly serious music it, it turned out in the end. Um, you know, it's not all kind of light and fluffy stuff, which we also love, with the exception of um, the Saint-Saint 
Ascanio, which is. Um, so yeah, I suppose that's that's kind of the, the kind of brief description of the, of the music on offer. I love it. Yeah. I, now that, you know, you talk about it a little more, it's like, oh yeah, they were all organists, but you don't make that yeah. connection immediately. So it's a really neat tie in. Was mm. there, were there any pieces that you were hoping to have, you know, be a part of the album and maybe just didn't quite make the cut? To be honest, it was always quite clear what we wanted to have on um, the record. Uh, we, we were performing, me and James, the, the pianist on the CD, James Bellew, who's a very good friend of mine, long-term musical partner. We've been recording, uh, sorry, uh, performing several recitals with the, the Frank being the centerpiece of the, the concert, also involving the Vidor and some other pieces that didn't make it onto the CD. Um, but we were, so yeah, the, the Frank and the Vidor, we always were quite clear about, about wanting to record. Um, having been the, the, the anniversary of Sanson as well, we wanted to include some Sanson. Mm. And um, really the De Rufle, um we're so happy to have included on the disc, um, is not recorded so often. There are some wonderful recordings of, of the work, but it's not often recorded. And, you know, there's not always viola players on, on hand for flute yeah. recitals, because that, that piece is for flute piano and viola for those of you who don't know it so there was the opportunity to include this um, as well which is a really fabulous piece I think mm -hmm. um, in retrospect it would have been nice to have um, included maybe some works by Taffanel but and this is something we thought about but it just I, I like the kind of uh, makeup of the record as, as it is and I think the balance works and so in the end we decided to to leave that out but he's very much there in spirit as several of the works were um dedicated to him um, or he gave many performances of them and he was very much influencing the sound of the instruments around the time that these works were being being written so he's he's not there in composition but he's there in in spirit so most definitely most definitely yeah i i really love all the repertoire and, and um, I had listened, you did a really wonderful interview with Gramophone, um, a podcast interview. So I'd recommend everybody check that out um, for a little bit more of the background info. But you'd mentioned that, um, you know, you had programmed the Franck several times on previous recitals and, you know, would at the last minute take it off. Um, what made the piece so daunting to perform publicly like that? I first programmed it quite a while ago when I was like 20. 122 or something around the time I started um, in the LSO, London Symphony Orchestra. And yeah, it, it wasn't characteristic of me at the time at all to, to change programmes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really wanted to, to play the Frank, um, but it, I just always got too scared. And I, it, you know, it's not that I got to the stage of rehearsing it and then I, and then I changed it. It was always in advance, but I, I suppose, you know, it's just, is so well known and um, everyone has their own kind of story with that piece and uh, approaching it on the flute, you, one has to kind of go outside one's comfort zone, I think, in order to find the, the workings of the piece and to make it kind of work on the flute and to add variety of, of color and, and this kind of thing. Um, not much actually needs to be changed from the violin part, um, just a few, especially in the second movement, some octaves and some double stops, but it actually works quite well on the flute, but one needs to bring an extra amount of grit, um, I think, um, to the sound. And I think since then I'm in more habit to play kind of arrangements uh, of works of other instruments, not as much as some people, but, you know, a little bit more but at the time, not so much. And I think, I just felt like I was a little bit out of my depth. <laughs> also, I think in terms of stamina, it's quite um, it's quite tiring, you know, especially yeah. within the within a long evening recital. So yeah, I always chickened out, um, but then I came back to it a few years later. Probably not that much more mature than I was then, but you know, <laughs> maybe a bit braver, and um, I grew to to love 
performing it. And actually, I think it's one of these pieces that in the context of a concert, it just works, it lifts off and it has its own kind of um, projection that you, you don't necessarily feel in, in the practice room. So um, yeah, I've grown to, to enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, so you're not the, you know, it's not your go-to to play transcriptions, but do you have any other favorites, you know, written for other instruments that we've adopted or that you yourself, even without a total flute transcription uh, published? Uh, some, <laughs> maybe more on the kind of encore line, if, if there's a need for one, um, <laughs> if they don't have to get home, um, or if I haven't bored them to sleep. I actually, funny enough, one of the original programs which we played the Franken, we also played the um, Vorjak violin sonatine, which works quite well on the flute as well. Um, the famous G major one. I think the Frank works better because it's, it's got that kind of sound world that's not so far in aspects to the flute, um, you know, the, that period of time in, in um, Europe. And, uh, the Vorjak is a little bit more gutsy in, it, in a way and, um, you know, but it still works quite well. Um, and yeah, various other um, bits and pieces, lots of song arrangements, obviously, because as a flute player, we're, we're close to voice. Actually, my first, um, unashamed plug here, my first album <laughs> released a few years ago called Vocalese um, is kind of influenced by, by song. And they, um, we recorded the Messia sight singing exercises which are beautiful little pieces and not so well known um, amongst some other bits and pieces like the the Poulang uh, vocalese and other bits and bobs so but there, there are some other pieces I'm looking into in terms of arrangements as well there are some plans for the Katachurian which obviously Rampal helped um, transcribe for the flute and um, other bits and bobs and Szymanowski and yeah so watch the space very good so yeah if our for our flutists in the audience if you're looking for some more transcriptions you know it's always fun to steal other people's music and play it for ourselves there are definitely some of the i think some flute players out there who are, who are doing a great job at doing this you know people like um dennis burikov and other people seem to be very active at, at creating some really good um, transcription. So I think it's great that there are people around who are helping us all to expand um, our repertoire. So yeah, I agree. I agree. Definitely. Although it's more important for us to encourage all of our composer friends, I think, to write new music. Yes, <laughs> yeah, well. exactly. Exactly. It's, we can go in that direction too. It doesn't all just have to be, you know, 100, 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> a nice mix yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so thank you everyone who uh if you joined us a little bit late thank you for tuning in today my name is Kristen moore i'm the direct sales manager here at powell flutes joined by adam walker former principal flutist of the london symphony and powell artist and overall incredible flutist um so we are chatting about his new two new albums that came out in april uh french music for flute and uh the second one with his ensemble orsino uh the album is titled belle epoque um so adam for those in our audience who might have future thoughts about recording an album of their own but are just a little too um anxious to kind of dive into that. Can you describe what was the recording process like? Um, did you do it during COVID? Yeah, for the for the Bella Pock, for the Orsino disc, we did. It's all kind of blurred in a little bit. My memory is to the different stages of, of the pandemic and, and whatever. But yes, we were very much socially distanced recording as well. So we were luckily in a big space, but kind of two meters apart from each other, <laughs> which was, you know, we, we were fine. And in a way, I think having that kind of distance makes you listen in a slightly different way, but um, presents its own challenges as well. So, so um, yeah, we, it was during the pandemic. Um, in terms of the recording process, I think it's very much a, a personal experience for everyone you know we all have our different kind of um, rhythm of working um, our own needs our own work pace and, and all these kind of things and of course producers 
and people who are helping us with and with creating the CD. So I think it all very much depends on, on colleagues um, as well as your own place and how you're feeling. But I think obviously some very important things are preparation. <laughs> you want to obviously arrive at a, a recording and be in a mindset where you can feel free um, to communicate because I think it can, under a pressured environment, it can often become about nailing um, something and getting it right and not messing up and actually we want to be feeling so secure that we can perform as we would in a concert um, so ample rehearsal time I think uh, it's always important to make sure you have enough time at the beginning of the sessions to experiment with the sound a little bit um, placements of microphones um, balance all these kind of things um, it's always a good idea to leave a good hour, at least, I think, just to play around with these things and have a good dialogue with the person in the box who's helping you, the producer or the sound man, sound person, rather. And um, stamina, I think, you know, it's good to pace the repertoire well and to have a good plan of uh, time scale because I think it's very easy to spend the first couple of hours on, on maybe one movement and then suddenly you have umpteen things to, to record as well. So good time management is good. I think to be honest, for a lot of people, the recording process itself is often fine. It's the editing process that comes afterwards that can be slightly harrowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's very confronting um, to have to kind of sit down and, and listen to yourself especially in the first edit when, you know, there's not so much bloom on the sound necessarily or whatever. And to really have to go through your, your, your performance or you and your colleagues with a fine tooth comb and that can be quite, quite weird, I think. Um, a good friend of mine, Nick, actually, who's playing on the Orsino disc, Nick Daniel Oberist, um, told me that his, his method is to when you first approach listening to the edit is to put it on in a different room <laughs> and listen to it kind of as you're doing chores around the house or whatever and then kind of creep your way in <laughs> and kind of grow into it and I think when you listen from afar and you're not listening to all the fine details straight away you can actually appreciate it much better yeah. than dive I like into that approach. Like, so um yeah, I'd say be prepared for the, doing the edits for those of you who are new to the process. And I think it's very easy to kind of write essays about all the bad things about what you want to correct. But I am try I try to be quite sparing with my notes for the producer because I think if you fix too much, it can sound very boring and plastic, and and it ultimately it wants to sound like a a performance and a co communication so the odd bit of you know grit and um whatever it doesn't matter i think it's more important that it says something and has a message yeah yeah absolutely that's a that's a great point we don't want to take away the spontaneity of the performance and you know what makes it really special and unique did you have a hand in the production aspect other than you know kind of sending those edits I have to say, so I, I recorded the CDs for Shandos, um, UK-based company, who are a really fantastic company. Um, they have a wonderful setup with sound and production and everything. So I have to say I was in quite a luxurious position. Um, we had a wonderful producer, um, Jonathan Cooper, who actually was an oboist at some point. Um, so, you know, coming from that wind playing perspective, a great awareness of sound. I think the flute can be a very difficult instrument to record in a way because often it's too closely mic'd and um, it can sound a bit tornado-y sometimes or, <laughs> you know, all the unpleasant yeah. sounds that we have to produce that no one can go for six hours a day playing like an angel, you know. And I think naturally our sound kind of resonates further away than lots of other instruments. So I think it's important to have someone who can appreciate how how the flute produces its sound, um, depending on the room you're in. Um, so to be honest, I didn't have 
that much input. I mean, you know, we discussed a little bit about acoustic and placements of mics at the beginning and some edits, you know, that you know are awful is good just to be like, mm -mm. and then it was, if you really liked something to, to say, I, I love that, you know, mm -hmm. kind of put that in the fridge and save it for later kind of thing, um, but not so much, no. Um, you know, it's funny that you talk about kind of the way to mic flutes and the best recording process. We're about to put out our June newsletter tomorrow and have a really wonderful article about the Philadelphia sound and, you know, the way that it can, especially for flutes, can sound a little bit pure and sweet and focused and not so loud up front, but is really going to project to the back of the room and you know, so it's easy to just think, oh, this is a small sound. It's not going to go anywhere, but it can be very deceiving. That's interesting. I have to say, um, I, having done a little bit more in the States recently, it, it's really interesting to, to meet people from all over, the, all over the world, you know, different flute traditions and stuff. And um, it, yeah, it, it's quite funny, I think, in terms of that projection of sound, which is obviously a, a universal thing and, and, and how, how we do that. But um, there is a certain ring um, that one can put on the sound, which helps project. And it's something that I talk about a lot of my students in London at the college, Royal College. You know, how do we project? How does a good pianissimo speak to the person at the back of the hall? How does a good forte project? And often I feel it's about having that kind of either sweetness on the sound or ring on the sound. I, you know, someone who comes into a room and shouts and forces their voice, you know, that doesn't project to someone who has that resonance, uh, you know, like a, a great Shakespearean actor, for example, actress, yeah. who has that kind of um, quality to the sound, which projects. And I think often someone up, up close who kind of is screaming in your face, as it were, um, from afar, it gets, is get lost, but the person who can speak with integrity and with beauty and, and resonance, this is the kind of sound that can really bloom. Yeah. And I think also just being mindful um, of the people at the back of the hall, you know, we always want them to be included. And I think um, always good to think in the distance. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You will have to have you on again, and I'm sure we could talk for hours and hours about just, you know, those more technical aspects that you go through with your students about resonance and vibrato and tone quality, but we'll, we'll stay on our task at hand for today. Hey, sorry, I'm getting verbal diarrhea, sorry. Oh, no, 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 it was not a complaint at all. It was more like, I'm really interested, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refrain. It's because I've been teaching all day, that's why. <laughs> Uh, so in regards to your, so your other album that we talked about a little bit with the mm. ensemble you founded, Orsino, <laughs> um, it's based as a woodwind quintet, but with a little bit of flexibility, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we, we are more or less a woodwind quintet. I won't try and kind of um, tart around that we are a woodwind quintet, but we, um, we like to, um, to work a lot and collaborate with different musicians that like pianists quite often, uh, string players, singers, what, what have you, and, and try different formations as well. And within the, the five of us, um, we like to kind of scale down um, instrumentation in concerts and play solos, duos, and, and what have you. So we, we try to find as much variety as we can um, within our concerts. But the, yeah, the core is the, the five of us, the, the five wind players. So. Yeah, yeah, that was a really nice, almost like a little surprise. You think of a chamber ensemble album recording link, like Belle Epoque, and, but there's the Chaminade on there, there's Syrinx, mm. you know, for solo flute. So it was really nice. There's a, a clarinet and piano piece, mm. um, flute, horn, piano. So it was really nice to have those smaller, more intimate pieces. Um, I really enjoyed the album. So- Oh, thank you. To, yeah, everybody needs to go listen. Um, especially the Coquelin. Oh my gosh, those nocturnes. That was a real discovery for me, actually, and a complete mistake. That that wasn't meant to be on the CD. We rehearsed it for the first time the day before recording. <laughs> <laughs> we um, that preparation that you spoke of. <laughs> I know, right? Um, that was that was a complete random discovery. Um, I'd actually been to um, 
living in Italy, um, I'd been um, in the UK for the for the first lockdown because I've been traveling. And at the time, I didn't have residency here, so I couldn't get back. So I was with family in the UK. And then I got back to Italy in um, June. Yeah, June last year. And I managed to get to Venice um, at a time when there were very few tourists. It was really amazing um, to have like St. Mark's Square to myself more or less at night. It was incredible. And then on the train home, I was having to do a little bit of work for another project. And um, I was listening to a, to a CD of um, Catherine Thomas, a British flute player. She, she's recorded a wonderful um, CD of um, Foray's Circle and lots of interesting composers there. And I came across the, the, the Kirklam and having not known it, and obviously one, the first nocturne is called Venice. And I've just been to Venice mm -hmm. and I just listened and was like, wow, this is amazing music. It's so creepy and uh, amazing, but beautifully crafted. And it's an unusual combination, I think, flute, horn and piano. And the way he kind of interweaves the two instruments that we're not often playing at the same time, but we pass on from each other. And the way that he's used the register, sometimes you're not sure if it's the horn or the flute. It's kind of incredible mm -hmm. what he's done. So yeah, sorry that, to go off on one, but that, that was the story behind finding those, those pieces actually. So nice oh, little yeah. last no, minute. No, I think that's it's the, the really fun part, you know, kind of the purpose of our conversation is those all those stories behind the recordings. You know, it's one thing you are telling a musical story that we're listening mm. to, but you know, what's going on behind the scenes, I think is just as fascinating. And you're mm. absolutely right. There were there were moments where your your timbre just they would, oh, it was it was really creepy, as you said, and, and so cool. It is. Yeah, he's he he so the first nocturne in Venice and then the second one in the forest. Um he he manages to find this these magical atmospheres, very particular atmospheres for every kind of image and mood that he wants to conjure up and um yeah, really special music. And it's just quite funny because actually a lot of people since the release have been like, I just loved the, the Kirkland so much. Uh, what a discovery. And it's just quite funny that actually that was kind of a last minute, like, okay, we'll include. <laughs> and uh, it's a tiny little mini piece, you know? So it's wow. interesting what can, as you were talking about, you know, in the context of an album and, how we juxtapose different pieces is quite interesting in the end what sticks out you know mm -hmm. not always what you would expect so yeah absolutely mm. so was it just was it the plan all along that you would release both albums at the same time or did the stars align and it just kind of worked out that way actually i had nothing to do with the release dates uh i, I think <laughs> i take it the stars kind of aligned really i mean uh, in a way, I can see how they work well together in that they're both very much about French repertoire. It's so funny, actually. I remember when when we started the group, we were kind of thinking we want to, because our first project was all based around Czech music, and that's another, hopefully, another project in the future. But we were like, we don't want to start our, our, our first recording with French repertoire because it's a bit, you know, been done blah, blah, blah. and it's just it happened. And the same with with my album with James, you know, the the, the the French flute uh, album, but there's just so much wonderful music, and it was such a time of innovation. The, the Belle Epoque, um, the uh, the title of the Orsino album, um, you know, so many develop developments being made in the woodwind world, and in France becoming the centre of that world, particularly for the flute. So, I think having that on both albums, they they do pack quite nicely um, mm -hmm. together. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I was, you know, of course, listening just for fun, but then also to kind of dig in a little bit more and hear some of those layers before we chatted and, you know, going back and forth between the two, it, they're a really nice pairing. So mm. well done. Oh, well, you know, just purely by chance. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the, you know, as we mentioned, there's um, some pieces that are, you know, smaller instrumentation, the, the shamanad, syrinx, and, you know, when you hear them in the context of a chamber 
album they it can really change the way you hear them mm -hmm. um and and you know changing that context so did you alter your approach to the way you play them keeping that in mind um well with the chaminade kind of yeah um it was the first time i'd worked with pavel kolesnikov who is the pianist on, on our cd extremely lucky to work with him he's an absolutely phenomenal musician and I think uh, as a flute player, uh, it's nice to work with different musical partners because in terms of chamber music, there's a lot of wonderful stuff, but it's a little bit narrow compared to other instruments. You know, we have a wonderful contemporary music being written for us, wonderful Baroque music. I mean, to have all those Bachs and Artas is just incredible. In the middle, you know, it's not like the clarinet where we have Brahms and whatnot. So. I think it's really nice to have a variety of musical partners actually and to, to play maybe some of the same pieces with different people. Um, so being the first time I worked with Pavel, it was, it was really nice to kind of um, adjust to him. He didn't like the Chaminade, I think. I remember in the first rehearsal, in the first rehearsal he just seemed a bit like, oh. Uh. But I, I have a, a, a kind of, you know, I, I like the piece. I, I played it a lot when I was quite a lot younger and mm. there's a, a special place um, for that piece for me. Um, but he's got this wonderful lightness of, of touch when he plays the piano and a wonderful spontaneity. So such sensitivity and he really sparkles. So, you know, that was, it was a challenge in his own way to kind of go with that as well. So he... He really helped, I think, elevate the, the performance of that piece, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Syrinx, obviously, the other staple of, of the flute repertoire that's, that's on the CD. Um, yeah, I mean, as you probably noticed, it comes at the very end of the CD. And I think in terms of placing, you know, the Belle Park, this period of kind of not just innovation, but beauty this beautiful period you know before world war one uh, kind of golden age of you know art sciences and relative peace and then you know after this obviously we have upheaval and, and very very difficult times and i think the the debussy which is fairly late in comparison to the other pieces on the cd is kind of ushering in a, a new era both musically but also in terms of you know the, mm. the landscape of the world and, and what was to come so slightly creepy and mournful ending to this this um uh collection of pieces yeah that's really that puts a different puts it in a different light you know especially because so often i think we hear syrinx you know if it's an encore on a recital or after a concerto you know mm. It's the piece everybody knows and it's just like a nice parting gift but now if we're seeing it in that context of what's to come mm. you know i think we're all going to listen with new ears <laughs> also because caplay who the, the composer of the quintet which is really the main kind of meat of the, the cd it's a very substantial piece um was an extremely talented musician composer conductor um actually he conducted the boston opera Ah. Uh, yeah, but he um, and he at the conservatoire, the Paris Conservatoire, which is another huge part of both these CDs, he won the 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 prize, the Prix de, de Rome, the, mm -hmm. the main prize, and he actually beat Ravel wow. um, to win this <laughs> to win this prize. But he his life was cut tragically short because he he'd been in World War One and in the trenches and all these things and. After, some time after that, the, due to complications um, of his health, as a result of, of his fighting in World War One, he died very young. Mm. So, you know, we had this amazing talent and who knows what could have happened with him and his life was tragically cut short. So mm. also, you know, to end with the, the death of Pan and Syrinx and Debussy and all this, is, is there's kind of mess hidden messages and... and and games at play um, in the in the program as well. <laughs> wow! Thanks for sharing that insight. It it adds a whole new meaning to the album, and um, you know all those little things to look for as we listen.
So I would love to shift a little bit. Um, and again, if you um, are just tuning in to Adam's two new albums, uh, Belle Epoque from his ensemble Orsino and French Works for Flute, make sure you go listen. Um, but let's uh, shift a little bit. I'd love to talk about um, your career as some of our audience may or may not know. You were um, for over 10 years, uh, principal flutist of the London Symphony Orchestra and recently decided to leave uh, your job. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit, you know, how did you know it was the right time to make this pretty big change? I didn't really know it was the right time. It, it was a very difficult decision. And um, I have to say my colleagues were extremely patient and, and let me kind of take a bit of time to figure out what I was doing, um, which I'm very grateful for. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd been in the LSO for 10 years. I got the job when I was 21, so very young fresh out of college um i think they they took a slight risk and a punt <laughs> giving me a job um but i think you know that's the the way it worked out and um an incredible job it was so lucky to be there it was just really my 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 musical life definitely been a massive part of my life and me um throughout my entire 20s um and many wonderful memories and too much to say really to put into words but there came a point where you know i was doing this alongside other musical commitments which i've always held on to from a very young age lots of chamber music solo stuff uh recently more teaching as well um and then throw into the mix a, a partner who lives in a life partner a boyfriend who lives in Italy <laughs> and has a nine to five job. You know, one can't do everything and something had to go. And I didn't want to get rid of any of these things. Um, but it seemed like the most logical thing to do. I think 10 years is in a way a very short period of time for someone who's been in a job all their life, in a way a very substantial period of time as well. And whilst there's always things to learn, always things to develop, and I was still very much developing as an orchestra musician and in so many ways, and um, I still had a lot of repertoire I hadn't played um, somehow. <laughs> um, I just felt that it was time to kind of try a slightly different route in my life and to give attention to sort of a few other areas perhaps that I hadn't had the chance to do so much before as I'd like and just to develop in slightly different ways so that's the the gist of, of why I left but it was a very difficult decision mm -hmm. and um yeah of course um some of my colleagues I really miss and I, I miss playing some of the wonderful music that we did I think there's so much nourishment um as a flute player and a musician to get from playing in an orchestra so of course there are things I miss tremendously but mm -hmm. one has to make decisions and yeah. yeah yeah and especially you know for winning that job at such a young age and you're still really forming yourself as a musician and you know you're you're kind of a little bit limited and as you mentioned all those different opportunities to explore and you know kind of hone who you are and mm. how you want to to play and all that so i yeah. think also though in your 20s you know you can do a lot you you can kind of burn out yourself out a little bit mm -hmm. um and I, you know i had a I managed to have a lot of fun along the way and to do lots of different things but I think they reached the point where maybe I know I'm still young I don't want to sound like a complete <laughs> old git here but I think there does come a point where you know one does have to think a little bit more about you know maybe not trying to do everything mm -hmm. um yeah. like you know in so many different ways <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely so aside from spending, you know, a bit more time with your partner, what else are you looking forward to with, you know, a little bit more flexibility? Spending time away from my partner. <laughs> um, <laughs> joking. I know, yeah, um, after COVID. <laughs> we, we do have a one bedroom flat. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's summer here now. It's a wonderful time to be here. Things are opening up. So it's possible to travel around a little bit, which I, is, is lovely and a real privilege. Um, obviously, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing my students back in the flesh. Mm. Online teaching has been a saving grace for, for, for many people, but I really miss that 
energy that you get from really being in a room with someone. And I think in, in, in terms of working with sound, you know, digital technology has come such a long way and it's amazing what we can do, but just having the sound in the room as a physical, almost physical thing that you can mold, I, I miss that. Um, I miss that energy from face to face with colleagues a little bit. We all do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just, you know, resuming concerts, traveling and things are starting to kick off again next month. And um, until that, until now I've spent quite a bit of time here, you know, it's been so complicated to travel. So many events have been canceled or postponed. So um, it's been nice to be in one place, but I'm like many people, I'm, I'm looking forward to, traveling a little bit responsibly again and to see audiences and have face-to-face -face interaction in, in the flesh. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, there really is no replacement for that in-person sound. You know, oh. No matter how great the album and the producers are and the recording, um, and especially, you know, you can only do so much over Zoom with sound. It's, uh, of course, and I mean, I think it's taught us all a lot about communication in so many different ways and having to think outside the box and uh, in many ways it's been a such a massive learning curve but I don't think we can ever replace that kind of you know human face-to-face -face mm -hmm. contact really. Mm -hmm. Yeah absolutely. I just want to read we have a couple of um, comments from our audience that are watching. So Nick Fitton, um, Adam is great we just recorded the or we recorded the Kevin Putz flute concerto at Peabody together mm. and Helga Howell is lucky to have Adam as an artist. I agree, Helga. Oh. She's never heard you play an uninteresting note and was completely floored by your BFS 2016 recital. Thank you, Helga. Ah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Helga. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. And, and if anybody has any questions for Adam, um, you know, I'm, uh, you're welcome to ask them in the comments and uh, we'll, we'll relay them and he can answer them uh, maybe on our webcast, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll throw them into the fire. Um, but please, you know, feel free to say hi or again, ask a question of them. Um, so Adam, I wanna shift gears a little bit one more time. We have um, about 15 minutes or so left. I don't wanna take up too much of your evening there. So when I was talking with Powell's general manager, Daniel Sharp, about having you as a guest, he said that you have great ideas on warmups and I sh must ask you about them. So, okay, <laughs> lay it on us. What, what can you share? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think, I, I mean, I don't think I'm particularly Mr. Warmup Queen, but I, I mean, uh, I don't know, I suppose with regards to, to my students, I, I, I often say, you know, cause some people feel the need to spend like an hour doing a warm up every day, you know, this, 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 this. And I, I very much agree as a, as a, especially as a younger person having structured daily practice and daily routines. Um, but I think in a way we can differentiate our warm up from our, um, practice routines, you know, all of our long notes and tone and everything. Partly because I think um, whilst you're in the profession, you know, if you're doing work, if, if you're going to play in concerts and whatnot, you know, especially touring, which we're all doing less of now, but, you know, you can't turn up at a venue and expect to be able to do a big warm up because mm. quite frankly, you know, that's not what people want to hear at 9 a.m. Um, anyway, um, we don't have mutes. And I think it's just, you know, you're not always going to be there on time. You're sometimes going to be exhausted on tour. It's just not always practical. And I think if you can somehow manage to condense your structure of your warm up into as brief a time as possible, it's very useful but also saves you hours sometimes as well mm -hmm. um so you know ticking off those boxes of things that you want to check in but in the most kind of condensed possible time i personally i think i, I would was it tough now maybe tough and i'll go back he he used to um hold a top c for a certain amount of time and try and get the most kind of pristine pure sound if he could do it he'd put the flute in the case and not put it to <laughs> so much. 
But I think, you know, just waking up the body, waking up the, the support system from, from lower down, um, just gently waking up the lips, um, but in as quick a space as possible and hitting a few extremes um, is a good habit to get into uh, when you're younger, because I think it can be quite a shock to turn up and want to do this amazing performance, but not have your kind of go-to thing. It's all in the mind, isn't it? I think anyway, performance and all these mm -hmm. things, it's all about psychology really. And just having that ability of, I'm gonna do it now right. kind of thing. And I think in terms of like, you know, orchestral playing also with my students, you know, uh, in a rehearsal, if a conductor, for example, asks you to do something, you can't give an excuse, you just do it, you try. You have to be open-minded and you have to be responsive. And there's no, no one cares about your, you know, your, your dog died the night before. There's, sadly, you know, isn't, that's not what it's about. It's not about you. So I think being open to respond to kind of um, instruction and um, be responsive. So in your practice, you're kind of really pushing yourself to, do something on the spot of course things take time to develop but also pushing yourself into just kind of right i'm gonna mm. do this now kind of thing yeah that's that's a really great point especially too because you know as a busy musician in normal times and you're traveling a lot maybe you you arrive at a place and you only have a few hours and you still have to eat and change and shower and oh, i mean hours would be luxury <laughs> <laughs> right? i think <laughs> yeah, time is definitely a luxury. So um, I, I really like that approach. I think it's really smart. And um, do you have like a favorite, you know, quick exercise or like a, a go to scale book or um, that you that you like? No, I don't think I've opened a scale book since I was like a teenager. I, I just kind <laughs> of, I think it's nice just to kind of make, I mean, the, to be fair, I studied these books a lot younger, so they're in my bloodstream. So I know them, but I think it's good for us all just to kind of develop our own kind of scales and stuff as well. And I think in terms of doing a warm up, you just want to hit uh, those spots. So I think, you know, you maybe some harmonics just to find some resonance, mm. some high quiet notes, just to kind of, as I say, wake up the support system and have a focus here. Mm. Maybe just a little bit of, of tonguing, you know, just, just gently kind of touching on certain things, but in a concentrated, Mm -hmm. um, way being mindful of breathing and also I think just quickly thinking about the acoustic that you're in and um because you know we have to adapt to each room we play in um and kind of listening back to the room and the sound that's coming back at you these things are, are quite important I think mm, I agree yeah absolutely and and sometimes you don't know the acoustic and so like as you mentioned having that versatility that adaptability to be able to change quickly is, mm. is so important yeah and exactly work in. yeah and i think you know we all some days we just have to take different routes in in our own performance you know some days this is going to be great some days this won't be some days you'll feel like this some days this has happened and you just have to find a different way and, and go with it sometimes i think so being open, even in our approach to warm up, warming up is is important. I think. Yeah, I I love it. Yeah, that's it's something we can all kind of take to heart and uh, condense. You know, have have the long warm up routine, but then also have that short one and be able to kind of change on the spot. So mm. you know, I'll give one last call. If anybody has a question for Adam, we're happy to to ask it. Otherwise, Adam, I have one more question for you that I like to ask of our guests and. That is, can you tell us how you came to be with your Powell flute? What is your, your Powell origin story? <laughs> well, I, I, that's not something I've been asked for a very long time, actually. But um, I, so I, I started off on a, a plastic flute <laughs> that was from a jumbo, like a secondhand store. And then um, a couple of, basic student models this is when I was about nine or something like a Yamaha and a, uh, something else and uh, then um, I went to study at, at Cheatham School of Music in Manchester which for American people I, I think the nearest thing that you have maybe is Interlochen or something like that it's a school for, a music school for young people 
and my teacher Gita Sorensen or Markerson, as she sometimes knows, she's the wife of Joran Markerson, um, said to me, you need a new, a new instrument. Uh, I'm from a very quite poor family, really, and, and we couldn't afford a, a, a good open hold flute kind of thing. Mm. Um, but we had a, a local businessman who, who was willing to give me a, a scholarship and, and for me to buy a flute. And I think there was like a British Flute Society convention in Manchester or something. So my teacher took me and we tried out those different instruments. And I fell in love with an Altus flute, uh, which was, I think, silver, but gold plated. So I was like this 11 year old boy playing on a gold plated flute. I mean, I cringe when I look back at that. <laughs> my, my poor parents probably were getting so much like mm. but it was it was the one that suited me at the time in terms of sound mm -hmm. and then it was stolen on a train two years later oh, no. when I was 13 which was very distressing for my poor mum oh. um and then uh with it, luckily it had been insured and, and so I was in a position to buy a new instrument and I loved my altus but I mean I was 13 at the time so I you know can't remember exactly how and why, but I, I've met this Powell um, flute and completely fell in love with it. And I played on this instrument from the age of 13 until my mid twenties actually. So for quite a long time, if a very young person, you know, going from 13 to principal of a major orchestra. Yeah. Um, but it got to a point where it was a little bit, you know, it, it, I needed something, something different. So I moved to a, uh, the power I'm playing on today, um, which is a, uh, you probably know more than me about Handmade the custom system. sterling silver. <laughs> there we go. So, you know, basically since I was, for a long time since I was 13, I've been playing on, on power. So, and I think I've just got so used to the, 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 the world, the musical world of playing a power, you know, the, the sound, the, the response to the instrument. I love the, the depth of the sound and um, the, funny how you were talking about projection earlier it has especially i think that the head joint i'm on is a philharmonic head joint which was developed really i think daniel told me to really make the sound ping out um from a distance as well so no i think powers have a, a wonderful kind of um dark um but sweet um quality to the sound and i've just got so used to the, that language now so I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of your your team and, and your apparel artists so <laughs> uh, we appreciate having you and uh you you make us sound wonderful so <laughs> the oh, feeling is mutual <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today as we chatted with Adam Walker, Powell artist, international soloist, um, former principal flutist of the London Symphony, and I'm sure many more exciting things to come. You Again, you can check out his two new albums, his solo album, French Music for Flute, um, has so much wonderful repertoire on there. And then with his um, ensemble that he founded, Orsino Ensemble, uh, Belle Epoque. So please go check those out. You can find them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Thanks for listening. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.